DG class, go there instead of here. I'm sure you'll get to see this stuff later. So, uh, I initially wrote this talk when I was uh, in the US in 2012. Um, John Stilwell, if you don't know him, write his name down, Google him. He's written a beautiful book on the history of mathematics. So, he's a mathematician who writes history book books for mathematicians rather than a historian who writes. Uh, mathematics for historians, so we'll get a bit of treatment. And uh, he invited me to give this talk at the University of San Francisco. So that's where I ran the first version of this talk. Okay, so I'm going to start at the beginning, because that's a pretty good place to start. Uh, the simplest kind of geometric object that I can talk about, I can talk about, maybe you can talk about something simpler, but um, I'll, I'll talk about curves. Okay, so I want to talk about notions of curvature and without formalizing anything, if I draw a straight line, I'm sure that you'll be inclined to say that the curvature of this thing is zero, because that's what we really want it to be. And maybe the next simplest object that I can really draw is just a circle. Okay. And suppose uh, it has radius r. So, can anyone tell me what we would like the curvature of this thing to be? You can say it if you like. Um, well, if, it, if you want more curvature when it's more curved, maybe it should be one on r. Okay. Um, well. Yes, but there's a good reason for that, right? I mean, if I draw bigger and bigger circles, it's becoming more and more like a straight line. Mm -hmm. So we would really like, in the limit of this thing, to look like that thing, the flat thing, the thing without curvature. So this is, this is pretty good. Uh, it's something that, that we would want. But now if I kind of draw something else that's squiggly, so, mathematicians like to sort of come up with constructions that encapsulate the different pictures that they see into one framework. So if I draw something like this, we want to talk about a notion of curvature. And so at every point, 
right? At every point, we can draw a circle of radius r, of some radius r, so this is a point x and this is some radius, such that the circle just touches the curve at that point, okay? So this is called the kissing cut circle, or in Latin, because everything sounds better in Latin, circulus os osculars. That's how you say it. And uh, so this is the unsigned curvature. The largest circle for which this works is the unsigned curvature um, at this point on the curve. So, I mean, if we go back to the picture of the straight line, we can choose a circle as large as we want that touches it, that kisses the, the point without it intersecting, right? Without it sort of, without it doing this and that. So, the, the, that recovers the notion of the curvature of, of a curve just being zero, okay? So, this is now a notion of unsigned curvature. So, um, what we really want is to talk about side curvature. So, for, for that purpose, maybe I'll move on to this board. Let me write down um, mathematically, <laughs> since you guys probably all study maths, um, what side curvature is. Okay, so we can just let gamma be some curve, some uh, differentiable curve. And we, we can always parameterize such a curve uh, so that its speed is unit. Right? So this is a unit parameterization of the curve. Now, if we do this, we can write the acceleration of the curve as some function, k of t, against the normal at t. Okay, so this is a, this is a vector. And this guy over here is exactly what we want to call sine curvature. So that normal is a unit vector? Yes, okay. always. If it wasn't a unit vector, then you can define it to be mm -hmm. right, a unit vector. I mean, if th this, thing is, this thing is unit, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so, um, so this curvature, so it tells us the direction in which this unit vector turns, right? So it tells us the direction in which this, this unit vector is turning along the curve. And so, um, just by convention, we say that the curvature is negative if the unit tangent vector turns clockwise. Okay? Right. Ah, sorry, the unit tangent vector, not the normal vector. Okay, so that's that's positive there. Okay. So um, and and we can recover this notion of unsigned curvature, which I wrote before, unfortunately with well, let's pretend that that's a capital K. So the unsigned curvature I can write as a lowercase k as just the um, the absolute value. Okay. Right, so um, okay, so in terms of sort of 19th century mathematics to the uh, mid-1800s, um, apart from isolated facts about surfaces, this is basically what people have toyed around with in terms of um, geometry. So let me put something up on this, the projector because there are people in here that like pictures. Um, Um, so, the person who kind of uh, really developed ideas about um, surfaces, uh, the two-dimensional kind of versions of all of this, uh, is, uh, well, this guy. Right, there we go. He was, uh, so this is Carl Friedrich Gauss. He was born in 1777 and died in 1855. So, you know, he lived a pretty healthy life, batted some good innings. And um, he was called Principus Mathematicorum. In Latin, it means the Prince of Mathematics. 
and uh, you can see that he looks quite regal. <laughs> <laughs> Some more photos of him. It's, uh, it's on a German stand, and uh, this is a pretty good argument to bring back the Deutschmark. He's doing a Mike Osborne with his eyebrows. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and uh, this is a, young, a younger version of him. You don't get to really see young versions of uh, Gauss much, but yeah, he looks like a prince. And um, so he referred to mathematics as the, the queen of the sciences. And uh, he had a varying sort of influence, a wide, wide influence, um, not a varying influence, a wide influence on many areas of mathematics. And, um, and as I said before, prior to about 1825 to 1827, only really isolated facts were known about surfaces. And so he, uh, he got down to a bit of work and he um, smashed out some, something called, um, I'll write the Latin title in here in case you're crazy enough to look for that. Um, this Returns general circa super <laughs> cheese <laughs> curvas, <laughs> which is uh, the, which stands for general investigations of curved surfaces. Okay, so this is around eighty twenty seven, and. Uh, I suggest that you, you read this at some point in your life, please. I only read it like two years ago. But uh, yeah, you will find this, I'll give some references later on. And, um, but, but I will just say as a word of warning right now that um, reading this is a bit like reading Macbeth. So it's, um, you know, mathematics was done quite differently back then. And, it's uh, probably wise to have a bit of a translation in order to um, in order to really kind of get through this a commentary more than a translation. Okay, so what are surfaces? Let me just. Does anyone have any questions up to this point? By the way, did you read this with a commentary? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you recommend one to us? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll give it in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So um, surfaces. surfaces. So a surface is what you expect it to be like. If I can be said about it. So, so I want to talk about a surface, something sitting inside three-dimensional space. I'm going to talk about a two-dimensional thing sitting in three-dimensional space. So um, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the important things that Gauss did was he formulated this in terms of what we would now call coordinate charts. So he said that at each point, there's some chart, there's some, there's some set around that point. It, it might not be the entire, entire thing, such that you can pull this piece via a nice smooth map and unfold it onto a piece of paper. Okay. So um, this I'll call a coordinate chart. Okay, so for all x, for every x, there exists a coordinate chart. And of course, I mean, this isn't enough. The coordinate charts where the charts overlap have to satisfy certain nice properties. Right? But I won't get too much into that. Um, but one thing that Gauss looked at was the notion of curvature at this point. Okay, how can I talk about a sense of curvature? So the first thing to notice is that if you now take a plane, You've got three dimensions to work with, right? So you take a plane and you intersect this plane with your surface. So that's going to give you some curve. Okay, so inside, inside this chart that we're guaranteed to exist at a point, we get a, we get a curve. And so he said that K1 um, at X is the curve that has the largest curvature at that point. Okay, so we can look at all these normal, um, so, so this thing is normal, the, the normal vector to the surface sits on this plane, but there's lots of different planes that we can have 
for which the normal vector sits. So you can intersect these different planes and you get different curves and then you take K1 to be the, uh, the, the um, curvature in the sign sense that I've written up there of largest, so largest curvature. Uh, and you can take K, and he took K2 to be the smallest. Right? Of, of the curves that go through that point. Okay, so... Um, so like either of those could be positive or negative? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah that's right. And the, the important thing is that, I mean, you've got to work hard, right? I mean, that's what mathematicians do. Why does the largest and why does the smallest curvatures exist? Maybe they don't. Maybe you, you can't find, maybe there's uh, an infinite family of curves and, and you can't find the largest or smallest. Maybe they'll hit infinity. So, you know, you've got to do some work to actually show that, that these things exist. Um, but essentially, this is, this is what he did. So, just to draw a few um, model geometries of different, um, of different uh, curvatures. Let me just... Um, right. So... Okay, so the sphere. That's one. So let me draw three model geometries first, and then I'll talk about their, their curvatures. Uh, okay. So this is right. That's a sphere. That's the plane, and that's a saddle. So uh, the Gaussian curvature he defined. So now that you have k1 and k2, he wrote the Gaussian curvature. Just write kg at x is just equal to k1 at x times k2 at x. Okay? Right. So, for this picture, the Gaussian curvature is positive. Okay? For this picture, the Gaussian curvature is zero. And for this picture, Gaussian curvature is negative. Okay, because you got you have one guy that gives you positive curvature, and, and you've got the other guy that gives you negative curvature. All right. Whereas, okay. So um, something else that Gauss did was he uh, when he wrote his the general investigations of curved surfaces, he defined notions of tangent planes, a notion of orientation for for surfaces. Um, as well as the notion of a differentiable uh, surface. So I'm not going to get into all of those things because they're kind of beyond the scope of the talk, but I just want to get across that Gauss thought a lot. He thought very hard about, about all of this. So, okay. Um, and he also discussed the sign of curvature in a lot of detail. Okay, so um, let me just write down a few more mathematical things to get to the main theorem of Gauss. So, if I have a curve on the surface, so, if I have a surface of this form, and so I can write a curve as just a map that takes me from some interval into my surface, and this guy sitting inside R3. So these are the two-dimensional objects sitting in R3. So what's the length of this curve? So let me assume that this is differentiable. How do we measure lengths? It's the integral of speed, right? The length is the integral of speed. So the length of this curve I just write as an integral of the interval right so this and so what's this this object here is just the standard inner product it's just a dot product 
uh, in R3. Or just as suggestive notation, I'll write it as a, an inner product. So it's just a way of multiplying two vectors. I'll use this notation to write it because it's suggestive. Something I want to say later. So the point is that Gauss looked at this, this, um, these curves from an intrinsic point of view. So what do I mean by that? So he took one of these curves, say the curves have through here, and you know that at, at this point, at, at every point in your surface, that you, can, that you can find a chart and you can pull it into R2. Okay, so this is some map psi. Now you have a curve here, gamma. So you have the interval. Gamma is that map, trace down a curve on your surface. You compose the curve and you end up in R2. And so this might look like that in R2. Okay? So um, then and you really should read this paper, especially those of you who are who maybe done a bit more advanced mathematics, because back in the days of, of Gauss, proofs were really about calculating things. You know, they they did a lot of calculations. They didn't really have the um, the kind of larger structures of mathematics that we have today in order to kind of reason about things. So they they really had to sort of sit down and calculate. And so he calculated the um, this, so if I can, uh, if I can call this guy sigma, so he wrote sigma in terms of three functions, e, so in terms of the, so let me just say that this curve gamma, t, it's just a vector in R3, right? So it's gamma 1 t, gamma 2 t, gamma 3 t. Okay? So he wrote this in terms of the direct, so he wrote out this expression in terms of what happens inside this chart. So I'll explicitly write it Just a quadratic ex expression. Okay. Squares there. Okay. And these E, F, and G, so E looked like, I'll just write the expression for E. So E looked like partial derivative of this, this chart now. So partial derivative of this thing against dx1 plus the partial derivative of this guy. Uh, sorry, I should really probably have written it that way. Yeah, I really should have written it the other way. So I'm looking at a curve in here, gamma, and it's gone back to some curve here and back. So I'm, I'm really looking at a curve find through here ending back up on the surface, right? So uh, these calculations are changed a little if that's not true, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I just changed my notation on the fly in this talk. Okay, so F now is like mixed derivatives, uh, partial derivatives. And so um, the point is that he expresses his curvature, this guy, the Gaussian curvature, in terms of E, F, and G. Its first derivatives and its second derivatives. Okay. So now he considers a development. Okay, so let me tell you what he so he considers a development, which is, a, which is an isometry. So, so, 
So let's call it F. Okay, so this is what Gauss calls it, but what we call it is an isometry or a local isometry. So it means that at each point, so this is in R3, this is sitting in R3. At each point, we have a map such that inside this little open ball, this chart, the distances via this map are preserved. Right? So what do I mean by that? I mean that the uh, length, the length of, of curves are uh, from here, well, actually, not even at the level of length. So if I have a curve here, gamma, and I have a curve here, f of gamma, then the length of gamma is equal to the length of f of gamma. Okay, that's what an isometry is. It, it preserves lengths. Okay? So, what uh, Gauss proved was that, so now you, can, now you can look at the Gaussian curvature here, of this curve, right? We've just got a curve here. We've got this isometry, we have a curve here, and we can have a look at this curve over here. And, and this curve is also going to have uh, e, f, and g's, right? So let me call them e prime, f prime, and g prime. So what Gauss proves is that e and e prime are equal, f and f prime are equal, and g and g prime are equal. Okay? So so let me state the theorem. Sorry, I'm going to erase this board. Just remember what the Gaussian curvature is. So he writes, he, so this is the uh, theorema egregium. It's uh, more striking when you say it in Latin. So this stands for the remarkable theorem. Or egregious theorem. Egregious theorem. <laughs> right. Gauss curvature is independent. Oh, I shouldn't say independent. I should, I should say invariant. Remains invariant under local isometry. So who cares? Why do we care about any of this? Anyone give me an answer? Um, yeah, but why do we care? Well, what's this, what's this theorem really saying? It's saying that the notion of Gaussian curvature, so Gauss shows a notion of curvature that is independent of the way. In, I mean, when we constructed all of this stuff, we assumed that this thing is sitting inside three-dimensional Euclidean space, we intersected it with planes. I mean, all of that kind of sends a message to us that maybe the notion of curvature I mean, we would expect that maybe the notion of curvature uh, depends on the way that this object is sitting in space. But, it's, but this theorem is exactly saying that as long as you don't change lengths, as long as you deform it through an isometry, then the curvature is an intrinsic quantity. It, it, it's independent of the way this object is sitting in space. Okay? So two-dimensional ants, for instance. The two-dimensional ants living on such a surface they won't actually know that they're embedded in R3, yet they can detect Gaussian curvature. Okay, that's the first consequence. The second consequence, well, you can still say, okay, that's all mathematically nice, but who really cares? So the second consequence I'm going to say, and I'm only going to state two, one pure, one applied, um, 
is, uh, well, an application to cartography. Okay? So, for a long time, ever since humans took to the sea and started ferreting about the world, uh, people tried to draw maps. Okay? So remember that the sphere, S2, that's the Earth, that's where we live. And that's what we like to look at. Okay? What it's saying is that there is no way of drawing a map without distortion. You cannot draw maps without distortion. No matter how much you try, no matter how hard you try this exercise of cartography, we're never going to go from spheres to planes without distortion. Because that's got a curvature in there. Yeah. Well, I mean... You can't have an assumption at every point. Right. Yeah. Whereas this map over here, you can have some Yeah, so, so the, 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 the remarkable theorem says that Gaussian curvature remains invariant under local isometries. So if the Gaussian curvature is different, then, it's, then it says that there cannot be, there cannot exist a local isometry. Okay, that's a strong statement. So if you try to let cartographers work that out, it would probably have taken them to the end of the universe. So, okay. so uh, let me now s sort of start saying something about the the second half of this talk, now that we've talked about surfaces, uh, whoop de da if you move on from them. So um, what I want to talk about is the guy who's going to appear on here in a second. So Bernard Riemann. So Riemann was born in 1826. So actually, uh, Gauss was still writing his, his paper on, the, um, on looking at these surfaces when when uh, Riemann was being born, um, not exactly at the same time, but close to it. And uh, he didn't live very long. He, he died at the age of 39, just like most good mathematicians. And, um, <laughs> and uh, so that was in 1866. So he was um, born in poverty. And uh, there he is, historic fellow. He was born in poverty and he uh, studied under Gauss at the University of Göttingen. And um, he died of tuberculosis during his third journey to Italy uh, because they were fleeing the invading armies of Hanover and Prussia. So, war is really quite detrimental to your health. Um, so, uh, so, Riemann finished his PhD um, and back then, and maybe it's still the same case now in Germany, I'm not sure. Um, he had to do an inaugural le lecture, a habilitation shift or something. And so uh, the candidate gets to put up three topics, which he did, um, and they're kind of meant to be related to his, uh, to his or her, uh, her, her area. Um, and uh, the first two choices, I think, um, I believe, uh, were, and the third choice was a bit sort of out of whack, but I think he probably just threw it in there because um, well, it's just standard practice that the supervisor selects one of the first two. So, con uh, so he, he put up a topic called the foundations of geometry. So contrary to, contrary to tradition, uh, Gauss actually picked this uh, third topic. So what ensued was quite remarkable. Uh, he had a breakdown and, um, and possibly at the hardship of carrying out a, another major investigation. But uh, in seven weeks, he, he put together this inaugural lecture. I'm not sure how much of it was put together in the seven weeks. Maybe he was thinking about these things um, uh, prior, and he just kind of had some moment, of, some some moment of inspiration or something, and all the ideas came together. I'm not sure. But anyway, he put it together in seven weeks to give this uh, inaugural lecture. Show another picture of him. It's probably a younger version of Gauss. Yeah. Sorry, Riemann. Yeah. Um, anyway, Riemann's name is on lots of things. It's, uh, if you've heard of the Riemann Z function and things, so he, he defined a lot of stuff. Riemann sums, I'm sure you've had to integrate a few things in your life. 
Um, so his name's associated with quite a few things, and he defined quite a few key important things. But um, so in this talk, uh, let me just say, so it was on the, um, we're just really interested in what he did geometry. So what did he really say? He said, so his, uh, I won't try and pronounce this in German because it's too hard. Uh, but his, his talk was called On the Hypotheses Which Lie at the Foundations of Geometry. And um, this talk was meant to be intelligible to all people. Uh, there were people from mathematics and philosophy and everywhere. And in some sense, what Riemann was trying to say was that the topological features, the structural features of a space needs to be distinguished from the shape of the space, the geometric properties. So what do I mean by that? So I can take R2 as before, right? And I can sort of stretch it and bend it. You can see that the thing looks different, right? But structurally, you should expect them to be the same. Okay. So let me give you even a better example. So um, let me take a donut or a torus. This thing has a very, very small hole, right? Structurally, the feature that distinguishes this object is that it has a hole. But now, if I draw this out, and then I make the hole really big. So the thing looks different. The geometric features of the two shapes are different. But the structural features are still the same. It's still got a hole in it, right? And I can still do, I can do this with a sphere. So I can take the sphere and then I can sort of elongate it into a cigar. Structurally, they still look the same, but geometrically they look different, right? And this is the kind of thing that Riemann was trying to get at. And he said that the metric properties, the, geome the geometric properties of, a, of the shape of an object uh, need to be globally prescribed, but they don't necessarily need to be absorbed from a bigger box. Okay? So, I mean, all of these things that I've, examples that I've given you up to this point, um, they're all sitting inside three-dimensional space. But his point was that it need not be. You can still talk about, you can still talk about a geometry, you can still give notions of length and angle without having this thing sitting inside a bigger box. So let me now sort of jump to something a bit deeper and explain to you what a differentiable manifold is. Okay? So, first of all, it's a set. So, it's just some set M. I'm not, I, I'm not expecting it to sit in anywhere, I'm not expecting it to be in Euclidean space, none of that. Okay? So, second of all, I want to say that for each point, for all x in n, so there exists some map on some set around this point. So this ux contains my x. It has to be bigger than my x, but it, uh, the, the point x. But it contains the point x, and it maps me into, it unfolds, it unfolds this U, ux into Euclidean space. Okay, it has to be injective, which means that it doesn't map two points to the same point, right? It maps the points inside UX to distinct points inside RN. And so the third thing is that if I now have UX intersect DX being non empty, then I want the map. So now I have two maps. I have a map psi x associated with this, and say so I have a map phi x associated with this, right? 
What I want is I want the condition that phi composed with psi, uh, which takes me from psi x of the intersection. I've already assumed that the intersection is not empty into phi ux intersection dx. So this guy is sitting inside Rn, and this guy is sitting inside Rn. Okay? I want this map to be differentiable. This isn't, this isn't exactly the definition of a manifold, but it's good enough for our purposes. Um, in order to kind of get rid of pathological behavior, we need to impose some conditions on what we call the topology of the manifold, but I won't really get into that. I just want to kind of give a, a feel of what this is saying, okay? So, I haven't drawn any pictures here in Euclidean space. I haven't said that this guy has to sit anywhere. All I've said is that it's a set, there are points in the set, there are these open sets, these, these um, larger sets around each point, and when they intersect, I can change my coordinate transform, because this is a coordinate transform, is differentiable. So, if it does sit inside Euclidean space, or I pretend that it does, and I draw a picture for it anyway, and I pretend that it's two-dimensional when it's really not, this is what I'm getting at. So, what I want to do is to say that, so this is my set M, and pretend that it's sitting inside, well, it's not sitting inside anything. It's an abstract thing, but at some point x, I have these neighborhoods. So ux and vx. And ux takes me into Euclidean space, n-dimensional Euclidean space. And this guy takes me into also n-dimensional Euclidean space. And now I can look at this intersection. And this intersection, so maps to this here, so this is psi x of u intersect, ux intersect vx. And this map here is phi x of ux intersect vx. And now I have an induced map between these two, right? So that's phi x composed with psi inverse x. This map, now I can talk about differentiability properties because I'm just back in Euclidean space again. Okay, so the point is that Riemann wanted to talk about these objects that look locally like the Euclidean space. They may be globally wildly different, but locally they still look like Euclidean space. Okay? So that was his uh, cleverness. And the point is that using this local Euclidean structure, we can give a notion of a tangent space for each point x there's something sitting upstairs which is a tangent space and this is actually an n-dimensional vector space okay and now you want to say well I want to give this thing a shape okay this is what Riemann was trying to say he was trying to say that we can give a notion of shape to this guy. And this is the metric. Today we call it the Riemannian metric. So this is a map that takes me from x to some function g of x, which takes two vectors. Maybe I'll write this here because that part of the board is a bit bad. So it maps each point x to some g of x that takes two vectors and gives me a real number. Okay? So, and this is an inner product. I want this to be an inner product on dx of n. And of course, I want this map to vary maybe smoothly in x. Right? I can ask for that too. So, let me just say that just like we had in the previous example, and that's why I was kind of careful about um, writing that notation. Remember that I wrote the length of a curve is equal to the integral 
over, and I chose this notation. Uh, So intuitively what happens is that if we now have a curve going through a point on our n-dimensional manifold, then we, we can use this inner product and when we differentiate that curve, it gives us vectors sitting in Tx of m, but if we have an inner product, then we can just replace this thing, the dot product, with gx, g gamma t, right? So we're measuring this along the curve, and we can actually give a length to a curve, even though all of this stuff is abstract. So the tangent plays the tangent to the to the curve at a particular point, and then it the tangent space is in some sense generated by derivatives of curves. Yeah, right. Okay. So, but the point is, it's all abstract. There's there's no requirement for this to sit inside a Euclidean spa space. And so one point that needs to be made there is that this n is not arbitrary. It's actually the smallest um, dimension for which that second map there is injective. Because otherwise you can just have the thing sitting in the Euclidean space sure. and that's injective, but that's not what you mean. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, I wanted to leave out, yeah. I want to talk about an n-dimensional manifold, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to leave out sort of yeah. too much details. Yeah. That's for you to do in third and fourth year or whenever you're going to see some of this stuff. So let me just also say that, that kind of one of the remarkable things is, and this is the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry. So I know my handwriting is horrible. It's, uh, I've tried therapy, but it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, so let M be an n-dimensional manifold. I should probably say differentiable manifold. Um, with metric G, Riemannian metric, I should say. So it has to be non-degenerate, right? An inner product is non-degenerate. Okay. Then there exists a unique Levy Savita connection. Uh, with respect to G. I'm not even going to really explain what this is, but it just means that it satisfies a nice product rule when you differentiate with respect to this metric. Right? Think about the product rule um, d on dt of gamma, do, gamma uh, t uh, nu t for two curves in, in Euclidean space when you have a dot product. You expect it to split up, right? Um, and you expect it to have you know, one derivative on one and the other not having a derivative, etc, etc. So, the similar kind of thing happens here with, with, with the G. Um, and that's what a levy Savita connection is. Um, and what, so, I don't want to really get into the kind of the details of what the words mean. I just want to sort of say the importance of this. It's saying that give me a manifold and give me a geometry for it, right? The geometry, the shape of this thing is externally prescribed. If you give me those two things, then I can give you a unique way of differentiating on this object. Okay? And in fact, notions of curvature actually lives in this connection. And this is kind of the picture that you develop much later, but the point is that curvature lives in here, but because it uniquely arises from this G, then it's really telling us about the curvature of our geometry. Okay, so uh, who cares again? Who cares about this? Do any of you guys care? <laughs> uh, oh, I do. I wrote a paper. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the point? What's the point of? What do you think is the point of doing this? 
Why are we, why are we being so careful to, to hide this bloody thing and not having it sitting, sitting in a box? I mean, where are we right now? <laughs> we have no idea if it's enclosed in anything. Sorry? We don't have any idea if the universe is enclosed in anything. Right, we're in the universe. Okay? So, if I, if, I, if I stick my universe M inside a bigger box, yeah. then you've got to explain to me what this bigger box is. The point is that I want M to be the universe, and I can start talking about taking angles, I can start talking about uh, lengths, I can talk about shortest paths between points, but I have to do that in an intrinsic way. If I do it in an extrinsic way, then you've got to justify to me why you're approaching things from an extrinsic point of view. And then you've got to explain to me, well, where is that space in? What's that space all about? So, or, I mean, so this, all of these ideas and technology, I mean, Bernard Riemann, as I mentioned before, he died in, uh, I think, 1866. So, Einstein in 1912 was introduced to Riemannian geometry by uh, Grossman and um, on the recommendation of Levi Savita, actually, uh, he started to look at um, using these ideas from Riemannian geometry to construct his theory of gravity. So um, maybe I've got five minutes, so I'll, I'll end there. I, I guess the, the, the point I'm trying to make, and I've given a couple of examples here, and maybe you're the wrong crowd to make this point too, because you're probably convinced that maths is important. But first as an application to cartography, but secondly as an application to try and understand the universe itself, which is a pretty important thing, I think. Um, you've seen that actually the mathematical theory has far, proceed, uh, far preceded the, uh, the actual application. Okay, so Riemann didn't sit there going, ooh, you know, my boss is going to make me make some application for this, that, or the other. I better dream up with Romanian geometry. I mean, he did it because it was fun and beautiful. And maybe he did have some motivations for physics. But he possibly, I don't think, could have known that uh, general relativity was going to use the ideas of his kind of setup, which he constructed 50 years, 60 years prior to the conception of, um, of general relativity uh, to actually describe the universe. So, um, anyway, in general relativity you can't really have a Riemannian metric. It's actually called a pseudo-Riemannian metric. And um, it gives a hyperbolic geometry to this thing where the light rays, actually things with zero mass, realize the shortest distances between points and they have a finite speed and we call it the speed of light. So, um, the, the, the analysis there is a little bit more compl complicated, but space looks like this. So, you know, maybe I'll just end there. <laughs> oh, uh, just in terms of um, references, I should uh, say that um, I think I... So, let me scrap this. And So this Spivak, Michael Spivak, um, so he has a comprehensive uh, introduction to diff geometry, which you can expand out the abbreviation. So volume two, uh, page 55 to 200. And there's... Um, in Berger, Berger, I'm not sure, a panoramic view of um, panoramic view of Riemannian geometry, uh, page one one nine to page to one twenty four. I think this is where I read the the original paper of Gauss, uh, and then of course there's Gauss's paper, uh, there's a big, large translation from Princeton, I think, um, some guys at Princeton. So this is Gauss's paper, General Investigations of Curved Surfaces, 
Um, so it's translated with notes and it's by J.C. Moorhead and A.M. Hilter Michael. Okay, so those are the, um, the references. Uh, what about the history book? What was the history book? What was his last name? Oh, John Stilwell. Stilwell. Yeah. Uh, Well done. Questions? Um, so, uh, peculiarities of mathematical history and notation. So, it's called the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry, but it's about Levi Civita connections. So, it's not like Levi Civita's theorem or anything like that. The way that theorems get named seems to be very strange. Can you elaborate? Uh, not really. <laughs> I mean, sure. Yes would be the answer. <laughs> yes, it, it is strange the way things get named. I guess it's maybe it's just that if someone proves it, it's not, and it's important, but it's it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, maybe they'll just give this theorem the name of the guy, girl, who proved it. Unless it's gas or oil that proved to be things. <laughs> but maybe if it's as important as the fundamental theorem of Romanian geometry, then yeah. it transcends names. So the key is prove things, but don't prove things so important that people won't associate your name to it. <laughs> Any other questions? No? You really need to talk Oh, thank you. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Yeah. 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 See you for a no, no, no. You were here last year, too. I mean, 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 I